Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the PGA panel on greening your sets. My name is Leslie Lopez, and I am a producer and the chief operating officer of Recon Productions, a sustainable company in Culver City. I'm also one of the co-chairs of PGA Green West. I will be your moderator for tonight. I'm joined by our wonderful panelists, Blake Levy, the executive producer, media strategist, and founder of Camp Presents, Faith Namisan, eco-coordinator of CBS Series Bowl, Kathy Johnson, the executive producer of the CBS Series Bowl, Julie Christes, founder and CEO of Tandem Pictures, Johnny Blitzstein, chief operating officer and co-owner of Tandem Pictures, and Natasha Sixen, sustainability coordinator for Camp Presents. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and being willing to share your sustainability stories and green efforts. So I think the best way to start our conversation this evening is by setting our frame, defining our terms. As we all know, being sustainable and going green can look and feel very different to everyone. Oftentimes it's a very different experience depending on who you are or how you came to join the effort. So let's begin by each of you telling me what sustainability means to you. Let's start with Johnny. Hi, thank you so much, Leslie. I really appreciate it. And uh, Julie and I are both so thrilled to be here on behalf of Tandem Pictures. Um, when I think about sustainability, um, I think about climate justice, um, equaling social justice and intersectional environmentalism. I think about the fact that for us, sustainability is about balance and sustainability is about empathy because who we are and how we conduct ourselves and how we enact sustainable practices ultimately is a, a signifier of how we feel about other people in our communities, in our circles, extending out into our friends, families, and out into the world and thinking about the future. Wonderful. Julie, do you wanna add on to what Johnny is saying? That was beautifully articulated, John. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, we take an intersectional approach for that exact reason that you we don't feel like you can just look at climate justice and not acknowledge um, our fellow human beings that are impacted first by climate injustice and what communities those people are from so they're they're linked and um, I don't know for me I think it just means our survival to be quite honest, we're at a point now where if we don't all make some change and recognize that how we tread on this planet impacts um, our fellow global citizens, then we're, we're not gonna have a home for too much longer. Absolutely. Um, Kati, do you wanna let us know what you believe sustainability is? Kati, you're still muted, so hold on. Oh, I'm mute. There you to go. <laughs> with. No, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s, and so I do have a very early memories of noticing the large amounts of trash, trash developing and the pollution and experienced the first Earth Day. Um, and so it, it is a lot of what you're saying about being empathic and being a good neighbor and being local. Um, I remember very vividly thinking, boy, I wouldn't do this in my own home and I wouldn't do this in somebody else's home. Why am I doing it outside? Why am I, why are people allowed to um, just have so much waste? Um, and my whole life, I think I've actually fought against the idea of creating waste. Packaging has never made any sense to me. Um, so, and I, at also at a very early age, developed a love of Vermont where it's been a, a sustainability there has been an economic thing as much as everything else since before the, you know, before I was born. So I've taken those practices to the film sets that I've worked on. Um, and I do think um, I came across a picture the other day from 1989, uh, a small parade in Vermont about you know composting. And it was a whole parade, a July 4th parade, but it was all about sustainability and changing the environment. And here put into practice and it should have been. So absolutely so I'm hoping change comes quickly. I'm going to the panel again. Faith, what about you? Uh, okay, so I guess for me, I see sustainability as an opportunity 
It's an opportunity to reframe and adapt a new waste reducing mindset just by changing your approach and your habits in your everyday life. So because of that, I try not to focus solely on teaching people to save the planet, which is something I am passionate about, because I believe that the planet is going to always be here with or without us. So what I really try to focus on is teaching people to join in learning to save ourselves without trying to drag out my proverbial soapbox and teach all of the tenets of sustainability. Um, but in that way, I guess sustainability to me is definitely a personalized mission. It means learning the unique way in which you as an individual can feel passionate, responsible, and consistent in your actions in reducing waste and just trying to empower you as an individual to find a way to give back. Wonderful. What about you, Blake? Yeah, I absolutely love that faith. Um, so I look at sustainability and production just like we all look at safety. You know, anything on set, safety comes first. I think that if we look at it from the same approach when it comes to sustainability from the beginning, from the start, when we're thinking about projects and what we're doing, that we're never going to recommend something that's not safe. We also shouldn't recommend something that's not sustainable. We, we do have knowledge out there of what is sustainable. And I think that if we look at it that way from the beginning of our project, it makes it a lot easier than at the end trying to make something sustainable that inherently isn't. But if we can come in with it being sustainable, it's much easier to, to then make it such. Wonderful. And Natasha? Yeah, so I think to me, sustainability is a tool I use to feel empowered to face one of the biggest challenges our generation is facing, which is climate change, and especially the younger generations. Um, I also think of it as both a lifestyle and way of thinking. I like to use the definition, um, we are meeting the needs of today without compromising the needs of the future. And like many of you, um, I also like to use the intersectional point of view. So not only caring about the environmental impacts, but the human impacts and having historical recognition of how people have lived sustainably in the past, um, especially indigenous communities and people of color and see how we can use their valuable knowledge to help solve the problems we're seeing today. Great, all great answers. So everyone's journey to being sustainable has a beginning, something that sparked your interest, ignited your curiosity, made you care enough to change your own habits and push to integrate sustainability into your community and be part of your leadership. Just like superheroes have origins, I, each of you have your own green origins. So I would love for you to share what brought you to this table. Let's go ahead and start with Faith. Okay, so in the strangest way, whenever I get like kind of asked the question, like, how did you get into eco? Uh, the way I always start is I, I actually sometimes feel like I was the person less likely just based off of my history. Uh, I spent the majority of my life in African countries when I was growing up and both of my parents were African and I was a first generation American. And in the countries that I lived in, it's not like sustainability was something that was touted because it wasn't really, as you could say, in like a mass little hierarchy of need um, because people were mainly focused on survival for their families or on bringing success to their family. And then on top of that, I did go to business school where uh, when it came to sustainability, it was usually taught as being a co like a, a CSR initiative, which is corporate social responsibility but it usually seemed like it was more of a stunt than anything else. It didn't seem like there was actually any true genuine care. So it was funny, it took me kind of taking a step back from like this idea of sustainability to realize that I'd actually grown up being sustainable and actually the majority of Africans do have sustainable practices, be it from like reusing ice cream boxes as containers, as opposed to going out and buying a new like Ziploc container or reusing water bottle, like Coke bottles, instead of going out to buy a whole new water bottle. So then I started to realize that this idea of sustainability can act as actually, I guess, even more most effective when you find a way to personally engage with it. So even though I never, we never handed each other the badge of sustainability, we all were very much into waste reduction, as waste reduction also meant that you were wasting less money. So when I came across Earth Angel, who is an organization that even helped me get onto Bull and who Bull does work with, um, what I loved about them was the whole idea and focus of 
and concept of trying to ensure that sets ran greener. And this was heavily dependent on trying to change people's habits regarding how they handle and deal with waste. And for me, that just kind of clicked with what, like with my background and where I came from. And also because I know from my background, like I didn't have the green, well, I had a green background, but I didn't study how to be green. I felt like it was easier for me to connect with people who weren't necessarily, who didn't necessarily consider themselves eco-conscious, but just to kind of help to reveal to them the different ways in which they can be green. Because a lot of the times we do, we do actually participate in green practices. We just aren't aware of it. So yeah, that's my origin story. Absolutely. I definitely can relate to keeping containers and not buying new ones. Um, right. <laughs> uh, Julie, why don't you go ahead and share how you joined the effort? Sure. Um, for me, it was really through producing. When I started Tandem Pictures, I started it with the desire to give women more opportunity in front of and behind the camera. And one of the first films that I was developing and um, putting together was a small film called Wildlike. And we were shooting in Alaska at a time when the tax credit was really robust and, and you could get a really good bang for your buck there. And it completely changed me. You know, I, I was born in Greece, but I grew up in Brooklyn and going to Denali National Park was like going to Jurassic Park for me. I couldn't believe what 6 million acres of untouched land looked like and the wildlife that existed there just blew my mind. And it took over a year to work with the forest departments and the park departments and the highway systems and, and all of all of the effort that went into what I didn't recognize was being sustainable, as sustainable as a film team could be, how many people we would have, what type of equipment we would use, how would we travel in and out of places, how could we use transportation as location, um, instead of just using it as a means to get from one place to another, especially if that company move was seven hours long. And, and it really touched on every department, on every person, and just the tremendous beauty of that state of being able to take, you know, a Alaska Marine Highway System and see the, the dust of the Milky Way to, you know, the beauty of, of Juno to uh, Denali. It just was life changing for me. Um, and then when I, I had my own son, it really, it hit me even more deeply how important it was. Um, not just for my boy, but for every child born onto this planet to be able to have a sense of what it feels like to be a part of nature, to feel like you, you can be one with your natural habitat instead of constantly feeling like you're fighting it or at war with it. Um, and then my, my partnership with John, and I'll let him speak to it, John really brought a whole other level of knowledge around sustainable practices. And so I went from someone who was, you know, doing what I could probably the 20 things that everyone would do on set if they had interest um, in having a green set to really getting granular and specific about the creative and working with um, the, the department heads and the director to really ask the question of, okay, how can we accomplish your big idea, your big vision? and do it in a way that's sustainable. And that's, that's really been the, the best part of the journey um, because there's so much to discover and, and we found that there is actually always a way. There's always a way to do it. Johnny, do you wanna share your perspective on that as well? Sure, I'd be glad to. And thanks so much, Julia. I think you, you said that so beautifully. Um, you know, I, I got into this as a, as a young person, I was interested in recycling and save the whales and save the rainforests and other um, actions um, that were, were being you know, talked about in the early 1990s when I was growing up in American public schools. Um, and I was so fortunate in 2016 uh, to be asked to consult by lonelywhale.org, which uh, was Adrian Grenier's uh, organization. They have a movie coming out this year um, around their sustainability efforts and removing plastic from the oceans. Um, and they were looking to democratize the conversation around um, sustainability, right? At that time, back in 2015, 2016, we couldn't, um, the a person who didn't have a PhD wasn't really allowed to talk about 
um, sustainability because it was considered something that a, a skilled scientist um, only was the expert on. And that was part of how the system um, kept the average citizen from taking real action and really getting uh, active in that area. And so um, I suggested the plastic straw as an, as one tool that could be eliminated from our uh, personal uh, use as a, as human, you know, as consumers on this planet. Um, and so that led to months and, and years later, they did massive campaigns with Lonely Whale and the Strawless Oceans campaign to uh, eliminate plastic straws. And so I saw how that really transformed, you know, with millions of impressions and all this media around um, in the United States and around the world now, you know, everyone's using paper straws and metal straws and that's really changed. And so it inspired me. And so when I came to work with Julie, um, I said, hey, like we really need to take action, even though we're a boutique independent film and content studio, we can make our effort and, and help change this industry and be a part of this. So um, we took action with the Green Production Guide through the PGA. Um, and we use the Peach Guide, which is the production environmental action checklist, um, and that has informed how we put together projects. Um, and it's been it's been my great pleasure working with Julie these past four years to to do all of that work um, and and bring that to our company. Thank you, Kati. What about you? What's your origin story? I uh, I I would say mine has more to do with um, not having money than anything else. Uh, the I came out of the not-for-profit theater where you didn't. We used to straighten nails and we reused everything. And so when I started working in film, and I saw this waste, I found it very appalling, um, and it also very unnecessary. So. The number of arguments I've had with people about, you know, no, it's cheaper to throw it out and let's start all over again. <laughs> you know, um, it just, just it, like, it's just, it doesn't compute. Um, I always say that whatever production you're on, it's its own little local micro, and it has a, a load it can bear for almost everything. And so, um, so throughout my career, I've tried to actually kind of preach that we should only do what is sustainable for the production. Um, and ha I've had a lot of success with people recycling and um, reusing and uh, paying attention to what they, um, the waste that they create. But it really came from doing low budget things, theater and, and film and not having the money for stuff so that this one set became another set or, or this car, you know, became the craft service truck became the picture vehicle became the you know so on a small level that's how it started the glamorous life of a producer right yeah um blake what about you yeah so when we founded camp presents two years ago the idea um came about that you know we we're gonna do above the line producing and storytelling had previously done a lot of below the line producing and really looked at it from a macro picture of how could i both do what i love which is producing uh, but also uh, do good on a mission I cared about, which was the environment. And so I do believe the future of business is that people are going to want to work for companies that do good and that we as producers can tell stories, but the way in which we tell them can be good for the environment. And so our mission is sustainability. And that's how we look at it. And we think that that's something that's going to be more popular uh, with any, any company in the future. They, they're not more mutually exclusive. And that's how we into uh, becoming a sustainable media company. Wonderful. Natasha, let's close out with you. Yeah, um, I'm just in awe of everybody's stories. I think they're so amazing. Uh, I liked Faith's story a lot because she sort of talked about her roots as well. And I'd like to just talk about that a little bit too. Um, for me, I think it just started just off the bat from my childhood. Just my um, parents, they would tell me like a lot of stories, a lot of cultural stories. And in India, you have a very, you don't really have human centric themes to stories. You have like world centric themes to stories where you talk a lot about animals. And so naturally you have this um, sort of aptitude to be very kind to everything um, in the world and just sort of keep those animals and plants and everything in the world in mind. You don't really have that ego as much. Um, but what really drove it home for me was in high school, I watched a documentary called Racing Extinction. If you haven't watched it, it's like my favorite documentary, um, but it talked about the extinction crisis and it featured people like Jane Goodall and Elon Musk and it received accolades at the Academy Awards. But to me, that was a very life-changing story. It 
pushed me to go into climate activism. And then I pursued a degree in environmental communications, worked at my sustainability department at my university, and then finally camp found me. And um, I think when camp found me, it was just a very full circle for me because storytelling was what brought me to be interested in the environment and pursue my career in it. But then now we have that same exact opportunity to inspire future generations um, to do the exact same thing. And it was also kind of funny because it was my dream to work at a B corporation, which is what we are. And it's basically, that's like, the gold standard of for-profit companies where you're basically legally obligated to balance people, planet, and profit. So I knew they would take me seriously there. Um, and yeah, so I'm just very grateful that they reached out and proactively reached out to people who are committed to taking climate action. So jumping off of that, um, each of you has a commitment to sustainability. How has that commitment personally and professionally impacted your work? And I'd like to start with Blake. Can you, Natasha just mentioned that Camp Presents is a B certified corporation. Can you explain a little bit more what that is and what it means? Yeah, yeah definitely. Right. And oh. I'm gonna actually have Natasha do this because we, the best decision I ever made uh, was, was hiring Justin and Natasha. Justin found Natasha, we hired her. We're a sustainability coordinator at the beginning of the year uh, to take it seriously, not just on a project, but on a company level. And so Natasha has done a lot more work in taking the B um, certification beyond just us certifying, but to us implementing and to us expanding upon it. So I'm going to toss it over to her uh, to explain more. <laughs> That's right. Working for Justin and Blake, you're making my egos skyrocket. <laughs> um, so yeah, a certified B corporation are basically businesses that meet the highest standard of social and environmental performance. They're a community of for-profit companies that recognize our world's problems can't be solved by just the government and nonprofits alone. So they're for-profits like Patagonia, Allbirds, and even Ben and & Jerry's and us that are using businesses as a force for good. Um, it requires like a certification process. So you go through that certification process and like I said, you have to balance people, planet, and profit. So you have a triple bottom line of those, all three of those things. And so you have to promote diversity. So we have very much commitments to promoting that. But then we also have to show how we're being sustainable as well. And I'll talk about how we're being sustainable at a future question. But that's basically what a certified B Corporation is. Well, you can dive right into that sustainability because that was what I was going to ask you next. <laughs> uh, how, how have you guys made your sets more sustainable? Like how has being a B Corporation changed the way that you approach production? Yeah, absolutely. So first I'd say on a macro level, we have externally facing language that is sustainable and we've branded ourselves as a sustainable media company. And that really sets the stage for our internal commitments because now we have to put our money where our mouth is and we have to show that we're staying true to our values. So it absolutely informs decisions of who we hire, um, who we partner with, and how we plan out our productions. So if you want an actionable step, everybody on this panel can leave. And once they leave, they'll talk to their CEOs, to their leadership teams, and decide how can we incorporate sustainability into our mission statements, into our core values as a company, and slowly let that trickle into the internal commitments that we do. Then on a more like, I guess micro level, I can walk you through what we've done for the pre-production stage of our next production. And that's the more low hanging and high hanging fruit, mixing communication and action together, which is so important. So for one, we have um, at first, like Blake and Justin will send me the editorial content for whatever production we're doing next. And I'll just vet that to make sure that we're having sustainable norming effects. So we're using sustainable actions and communicating sustainability and also diversity, telling them more diverse stories. Then we go on to onboarding. So we wanna make sure everybody, all our employees, vendors, partners, know the sustainability goals of the set and we'll take it seriously. So we kind of have like a three pronged approach to the onboarding where we have the onboarding presentation, which is basically telling those community, the sustainability goals we have an employee pledge that's available on our website for each employee to commit to having those sustainability values. And then workshops that are specifically tailored to that production. And then um, 
yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> but the ROI for sustainable media, sustainable companies in general is very well established. It improves productivity, job satisfaction, and retention rates. And so that's the low hanging fruit. Then there's the high hanging fruit, which um, is doing those certification processes. So we use something called Albert as part of our carbon calculator and certification parameters. And then there's also the EMA green seal. So what I'll normally do is look at our budget and see how we can align to all of those um, certification parameters. So just as a ex specific example, I was looking at the budget the other day and I noticed that we we're gonna be buying a lot of electronics, but part of that part of that certification parameters is that we can't use any batteries on set. And so I just made sure to communicate that to J but Justin Blake that we can't buy any batteries because of that, but that actually ends up saving money on our bottom line because now we're not buying any batteries, we're just buying a rechargeable um, electronics from the get-go. And then, uh, then there's the carbon footprint, which we have to mainly focus on energy and transportation since those are the main carbon emitting factors in any production. So yeah, then, then we start to focus on energy and um, transportation. Wonderful. Um, Julie and Johnny, do you want to talk a little bit about how sustainability has impacted how Tandem Pictures goes into production? Sure. First of all, this is such an inspiring conversation. Um, congratulations on being B Corp certified, by the way, guys. We're, we're close behind you. We're about to do the step where you change your operating agreement. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's not low hanging fruit. It's such a long process. It's so rigorous. So congratulations to you for, for having uh, done that already. Um, you know, I'd say some of the things are similar in that our mission statement is, you know, we're a company for people, the planet and powerful storytelling. And it, and it is as simple as, as that, um, that it's not just about choosing, choosing the, the best script and, and filmmakers and, and, and hopefully speaking for a way of life in a different way than people may have seen, seen otherwise, but it's the, it's the practice. It's how we do the work um, and how we speak to the team and, and hopefully help inspire them to want to make choices that are sustainable. And I think what Natasha said about, you know, happiness and morale has proven true for us anyway, that at first, you know, I've certainly been on sets where, um, you know, Kadi, I, I was laughing when you were talking about people throwing things away. You know, I've had the experience where a gaffer will be like, what is this, an indie movie? Throw those shells out. I'll be like, don't throw them away. <laughs> Roll them up. They're perfectly good. We'll use them next time. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, but, but, you know, it's, it's more just the, the, the job satisfaction that people have when they are coming together to make a great piece of work. They've taken the job because they, they're they earning their living, they believe in the project, they want to see the vision of the director through. And if we can add to that, that they're doing their work in a way that doesn't hurt their global citizens and that respect, respects the community that we're in and ultimately the planet that they're on, we find that everyone walks away feeling even better about having participated and that we actually feel closer to each other, no matter the size of the project, it ends up feeling more like a family because we all made this concerted, conscious effort together. And similarly, we use the, you know, we use the peach guide. We have a really close relationship with Debbie Levin and, and we were asked at the, the top of this year to sit on the board of the EMA and we're proud that we're the only indie studio that um, that is on the board and hopefully we can be a voice for more of our colleagues there as well. And, you know, we take that, um, that application seriously for the gold seals because for us, it means that the efforts we made, um, we, we could manifest those efforts into a reality that says this production was sustainable. The efforts that you made did work. You brought down the carbon footprint of the humans and the, the film that you set out to make. And that's meaningful to us and meaningful to the team. 
John, oh, can you speak a little bit? I was like, can you speak a little bit to how um, your sets have become green? Like, what are some actionable steps that you guys have taken? Yeah, well, sure. I, I can speak about Black Bear specifically, which we completed in 2019. Um, it's a really exciting um, psychodrama starring Aubrey Plaza, Sarah Gaddon, and Chris Abbott. Um, we put that together um, in, a, in about a 21-day shoot in the Adirondacks in upstate New York. Um, we we used solar power that switched over to uh, battery power backup when the sol when the sun went down, and then when the batteries ran out, we would switch over to a diesel generator, which thankfully we didn't have to use very much on the production. Um, and you know everything from from choosing that house to minimize our, our you know overall emissions footprint to um, having a chef on set who cooked in a real kitchen um, and washed the, the dishes in the dishwasher so that we didn't have to have any single use plastic or disposable paper plates and things on set was a tremendous move. And everyone, you know, I can say Aubrey Plaza down to like the, you know, the, the interns and PAs who came to that production, everyone on set um, got involved and were excited. And so from the, you know, what Natasha was talking about and this idea that it's just positive that, that being a positive company and caring about sustainability impacts how team members feel. It impacts your overall morale uh, as a group. Um, it's very true, and we've seen that happen on our productions. But from, you know, everything from thinking about um, what paint we were using, um, having donations of our uh, leftover props and design um, to Ali Pierce, our costume designer, thinking about how to, um, you know, work with costumes and, and found clothing, things that were bought locally, um, things that we could uh, purchase and then return, we really minimized so that we could have a leave no trace aspect to uh, creating a, a, you know, a pretty big, big independent film production. Thank you. Kati, can you tell us a little bit about how Bull became a green production? What did that process look like on a series television show? And was it well, gradual or did it happen all at once? I'm so inspired by <laughs> you starting from the get-go with the organizations that really believe in it. Um, we're CBS and we've since become Viacom CBS. So um, I feel like I dragged them kind of kicking and screaming. Uh, to it, but I think Sony was the other producing partner that had already done this. And so when I first, you know, said I wanted to do it, they're like, well, fine, if you can fit it in your budget, you know, they weren't really supportive. And the first year of the series, um, we didn't really do very well at all. But the second year of the series, I hired Earth Angel um, and they helped, you know, set us up uh, as a production with all the things we needed and we began that journey but I, I have to say it wasn't until Faith joined on which was the following season that we got the crew inspired and I do believe what all of what you're saying is it makes it's a cohesive process that makes everybody feel like part of a team and it really does inspire um, people to be more sustainable outside of work it inspires them to like talk about it inspires them to work together you know it's, it's, as a team in a way that just production you know which is a team uh, sport it, it, it's just this side note that, that actually added to our production and sadly when COVID hit we took a giant step backward but I think uh, we're on the mend from that because um, obviously cool. gloves and plastic <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit more about COVID in a second but Faith can you share a little bit about what you brought to Bull? What, what is it that you were doing in your role and how that kind of impacted and changed over the season? Most certainly. And thank you so much, Kati, for that, uh, for all the glowing compliments. Um, so yeah, when I first joined uh, Bull, um, my, like I worked under Earth Angel and I was, I was a, a, an eco-production assistant. So uh, my, my primary focus for my first season of Bull really was trying to increase crew engagement with the idea of being on a sustainable set that wasn't just limited to throwing out your waste in the correct receptacle. Um, so the dilemma I had then was this, was how do I get my crew members to care about sustainability and become more active participants? And the answer during that first season that I worked on Bull was why not a competition? Because uh, pretty much what I was trying to do was I was trying to tap into everyone, the idea of everyone having pride for their department and the thrill of winning in competition. 
And so what I did was I created this bull eco contest, uh, which was a point based system where points were awarded to individuals and to departments. And the way that individuals could earn points was through throwing, tr throwing their waste in the right in the correct receptacles, correcting other crew members if they saw that they weren't throwing their waste in the correct receptacles, uh, encouraging them and awarding them for points when they asked questions about how they could be greener at home or on set, um, running also little eco contests that were really heavy on eco facts and also practices and habits that we had on set and we encouraged on set. And then my favorite one and the one that was always worth the most points was um, individuals suggesting and implementing new department-based changes within their department. Um, and so like, I knew that I had tapped into something when I had Teamsters asking me why they felt like they were falling behind in, in the plant contest. Or when I had my grip department emailing me live videos of them taking their trash cans out of their offices and taking them to waste streams and trying to sort them out just to make sure that they got all of the points that were, that were needed. Or my camera department pu pulling me, pu pulling, bringing me aside and saying, wait a second, just that you know, Teamsters do have more people in their department. Are the points weighted? <laughs> and I was like, actually it is. I have an Excel document right over here with all of the points being weighted. So I guess what I really tried to do was increase this idea of visibility and like and foster and encourage competition, but in a way that did reward all of the departments. Um, and so after, after, and that was the first season that I had on Bull. The second season, I did step in in more of a coordinator role. And so the job type, the job, my job responsibilities kind of evolved. Uh, and to that extent, what I tried to focus on was creating systems and implementing systems and kind of doing a check, running a check and balances to see how some of our previous eco efforts now had changed in light of COVID. Because as I'm sure all of us can attest to, COVID did really change the way we work and it did change the work dynamics. And also it did introduce a lot of different type of waste streams on set. So uh, in that regard, my whole idea was, I need to ensure that the whole idea of sustainability is still visible. So what I did try and do is, um, create these food donation trackers that we put that we put around our stages since we donate food on set. Uh, so just so that people could kind of start to see the effect that they were having. So yeah, even though you didn't grab your lunch and you didn't touch it and catering still kept held on to it, that didn't go into the trash, that was donated. So it was amazing being able to like share those types of numbers with, with our crew. Uh, on top of that, Earth Angel did help a lot in connecting us with vendors. Uh, so for example, TerraCycle was an amazing vendor that we, and we implemented towards the end of our season. And they helped us recycle our PPE, our PPE, gear, PPE uh, gear so that people weren't just throwing them out in landfill or throwing the, the shields in recycling, which was great. But if it had the foam, not everyone wanted to take the foam foam out so that usually ended up being landfilled. So it was amazing bringing TerraCycle on board. Uh, on top of that, we also brought in open water since as I'm sure everyone on, on sets could also attest to, we're, there, we're trying to move away from the whole idea of multiple touch surfaces. So before we used to have gallon water jugs where people would just bring their water bottles, but since now those weren't encouraged anymore, we brought open water in so that we could, we didn't have to use the little plastic water bottles that are horrible for the environment. So yeah, it was a great onboarding open water. And also now we started looking into towards the end of the season world centric, which is amazing when it comes to having compostable individual like individually wrapped compostable cutlery, which is amazing so that it's not just there is compostable items inside of plastic that you have to recycle. Now we could drop everything in one go. So even though COVID did come with its share of challenges, it's great to see that it did open the way and the window to more opportunities. You're just segueing for me. Um, we're, we're getting <laughs> the, the COVID of it all. Um, you know, obviously everyone knows that it's completely changed how we interact with our world and how we do production. Um, and so, you know, my question to all of you is, are there any practices that you have implemented on set because of COVID that are actually more sustainable? 
um, that you're you're hoping to keep in the future in the new normal. I'm going to leave that one open for you guys. For sure. I mean, I'll I'll say two two things that I I love and I I hope we never go back to them are um, digital call sheets, menus, and sides. Like Johnny and I, for a while across a lot of our projects, were encouraging tablets. If we were doing client work, we would give, you know, tablets to those clients for the decks, because on the commercial side, those decks could be like 50 pages long and you print 50 of them and no one even opens them. <laughs> it's so aggravating, <laughs> so much waste, toner, ink, paper. Um, and because of COVID, again, the high touch surfaces, we've, we've just converted call sheets and all of the so much paper schedules that we use, um, whether you're scanning a QR code or sending links to people. And I, I really hope that stays because that's something that, that worked and it also reduces so much waste. And then the, in the post process, um, there's so much travel that is involved for us anyway on the film side, usually bringing, you know, the, the director might not live in the same city that you're posting in because of tax credits or the producers need, need to come and do their own notes review. And there's so much software that's been developed that really makes it feel like we're sitting together in an edit suite and in time watching something and reviewing as a team. And we're not taking any of those flights. We're not um, renting any vehicles and using gasoline. We're not doing any of the like standard business practices that are not sustainable at all to get through the offline, um, the grade, the color correct, the sound mix, all the things. So I, that's something that we're, we're definitely going to keep in place moving forward. And I only wish it had occurred to us before COVID that it could be done that way. That's amazing. Jumping off, Julie, what you just mentioned, um, for us, one of the projects that we were involved with uh, during COVID was for President Biden's campaign, we designed, built, and operated the first TV studio. And so the amazing thing about that was that meant whenever they used the studio, it was 15 minutes away from, from where he was staying. And so there was no plane. I mean, it's all the press, you know, the big movements that everything was reduced. And so every time that they came to the studio it was a time that we didn't go fly somewhere. And so I think that it was something from previous campaigns where folks wouldn't believe that if you took a candidate to a studio, that it would be authentic, that it would be engaging, that it could be something the audience at the end of the day, because I think that's why we do this to tell the story to the audience, that they'd believe. And because of COVID, it gave us an opportunity to show that the audience will actually generally believe and interact with which means that all of the travel, which is huge, um, but in making and building the studio, we also kept it, you know, we didn't use a generator. It was a conversation in the beginning. And we said, no, we're gonna be on, on house power. So how do we make sure that we can keep this up for the 10 weeks using house power and have redundancy in there? And so the reduction, if you were to compare uh, what we did in the studio compared to a traditional event in the same way, brought down you know, transportation, waste, you know, everything down incrementally um, that wouldn't have otherwise been even thought of or, or tried. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just go and say that as much of the virtual uh, that we did during COVID, we're going to keep going forward no matter what, um, because I think we didn't we didn't travel as much. Our post was completely virtual. The writer's room was completely virtual. They do want to get back together again, but it just seemed to make so much sense to keep as much of that. All our preliminary meetings can all be still virtual as long as we have the bandwidth. Um, and the other thing that is not, it's sustainable in a different way, but we had to put up hand-washing stations all over the place. Not the hand sanitizers, the hand-washing stations. And my entire, this is just a side note, my entire life I watched people get on the catering line without washing their hands. Because, you know, there's one bathroom and three sinks and you've, you're feeding 50 people. Now they don't have an excuse and they go wash their hands. And the truth of the matter is that people did not get sick. This, they didn't get sick with anything on our show. They didn't get a cold. They didn't get a flu. They didn't. There was no illness at all by virtue of the masks and the hand washing. And so I think we're going to keep the hand washing stations forever. <laughs> They're not going away. And uh, just to jump on top of that, um, again, also, yeah, we saw a drastic reduction in terms of the use of paper through yeah, no our paper. sets. 
which was amazing. So it was great to be able to say that, yeah, looking at the numbers from how much we were printing the season prior, we were saving a tree once every two weeks, as opposed to going through a tree at once every two weeks. So it's exciting to know that because of like, unfortunately COVID is what it was, but at least it did bring and it did bring the opportunity for us to go digital. And so I'm glad to, I'm very glad to know that like we'll, we'll be also continuing, you know, continuing to go to, to stay digital, which is extremely important. Then on top of that, also what I loved was the introduction of open water. So it was great to the extent where before sometimes we did have the small pool and spring waters. Now we had only aluminum cans on set. So, so those are some of the practices that it was it was amazing to have last season, and I'm very excited to bring that forward into the next season. Yeah. So we have one last question from me. Oh, Natasha, go go for it. <laughs> I just wanted to add really briefly. Um, I think COVID also sort of makes us think about things that we would have normally not thought of. So one of that is digital impacts. Um, internet systems produce 900 million tons of CO2 a year, which is a crazy environmental impact. Um, and what we do is we've implemented digital cleanups at the end of all of our productions. So um, we have people delete any extra files, messages, apps, um, that they don't need emails, especially emails have like a weird environmental impact. You can look that up too. Um, but that's just a way you can sort of think about it in that way as well. And then we've also switched our backup search engine. Our main search engine is now to Ecosia, which is the search engine that plants trees. Um, every 45 searches equals one tree. So we've been able to plant like so many trees. I think Justin had like 6,000 searches last time I checked with him. So um, it's a lot of trees that we're planning to. So it just allows us to think in a different way that can still be way more sustainable. Nice. Um, I am gonna ask one last question and then we're gonna open it up to uh, the audience uh, for Q and A. My final question is, is there anything that you do on your sets that is sustainable that you believe would surprise someone if you told them about it and how it's sustainable? I'm throwing a little bit of curveball. I didn't tell anybody about this question beforehand. <laughs> A good example of it is, you know, we've had set pieces that we have donated to a nonprofit that uh, furnishes foster youth transitional homes. And like, that's not something I think anybody would have turned around and been like, this is a way to be sustainable. Um, so that one even surprised me. <laughs> I think I may have one for you, Leslie. Go for it. Um, so uh, we, we had a project we were working on and we were fortunate enough where, um, the financing of it was coming from someone who wanted it to be sustainable. And so they put the extra burden on, which is always helpful if the people giving you the money are saying, go make it sustainable because they support uh, what you're doing. And so one of the things we needed on this particular location was a generator. And we've worked with options when you need a generator and, and how to make that green. What does that look like? What is that process? Um, but for this particular um, project we're working on, those options weren't available. Uh, however, uh, it was made clear to us that using a, a diesel power generator was just not an option and we needed to find power. And so what it allowed us to do is think outside the box. And what we ended up doing was pulling in copper and we actually installed power into the building, which we thought was going to be incredibly expensive. It was going to be so much more money than a generator. And turns out it was 20% cheaper than using that generator on that project. And so it really made us think that when you're doing things, even if you think uh, that something is the way to do it, just because it always has been done that way, I think we've all learned, especially when it comes to climate change, we can't do things the way that they have been done. And so what ended up happening is that not only did we were we able to install power, but then everyone who comes in after us uh, to that location now has clean power directly from the grid. And we didn't need a generator and no one else needs a generator. And so we really leave it better than we found it. And so that's something that we take on moving forward of sharing with the community of, you know, even when you don't think there's an option, there may be. And if in your location, bringing in power costs a little bit more than the generator, potentially working with your venue now or somewhere else, depending on what your location is, you may be able to get them to give you a discount somewhere else so that from the bottom line, uh, it doesn't become... Um, 
you know, something that is financially not uh, incentive, but actually does leave it better than you found it. Great, great. I'm going to open it up. We have three current questions. Um, I'm going to start with what I think is the easiest one. Um, <laughs> Michael is asking, what is the name of the search engine that Natasha mentioned? <laughs> Could you repeat it for us, Natasha? Yeah, absolutely. It's called Ecosia, um, E-C-O-S-I-A. And you can just add it to Chrome. You can add it to Safari. Um, you can use it on your cell phone instead. It's my main search engine for everything. I've been using it for the past two or three years. And um, they run on, they run on actually 300% renewable energy, which means that by using it, you're actually crowding out bad energy at the same time. And the more you use it, um, the more they'll fund, their funds will go to planting trees. And you can see their total impact as well. They have impact reports. They also have videos of all the trees that they've planted all over the world, really. Um, it's absolutely amazing. So I totally recommend everybody to use Ecosia. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask Eric's question um, regarding donations, be it set pieces, food, fabrics, building material, production expendables, etc. So many companies are scared about the liabilities of giving it away, so they shy away from it. How do we move past this and make donations easier? Um, Anyone can get that. Yeah, they, the there there are a number of. Um, you know, you can get a waiver of liability. Like we leave set pieces behind, we leave curtains behind and I always make us go to the vendor or go to the location and say, if you want this, you have to sign and waive all rights of liability. Um, I have a studio that helps me with that, but you get them to sign something with that and you're fine. And as far as food goes, uh, I don't think we do lie. Do we, Faith, we do no, no liability, but there's the, the what's it called? The- um, uh, Rock and wrap it. Yeah, we use rock and wrap it up. Which is, right, but it's it's the uh, what's the name of that law that basically you're donating food and they can't sue you for and they can't there's, sue. A, there's a that's true. Wait, let me see if I remember the call. no, it's the Good Samaritan law, the Good Samaritan law. Yep. So they, you know, if somebody eats the food that is that you've given them and they claim it's tainted, they can't actually get they can't sue you. So, so that's how you get around doing it. Um, just get a waiver of liability from whoever you're leaving it with or donating it to. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to that one before we move on to the next question? Just that if you're in a if you're working on location in a small community, one way to to, to get around that even is to look for um, local churches or food banks, um, anything within the community. Just going back to the intersectionality of it all, because something that's a set piece for you is actually a a crib or a swing for. A, a baby in that community. Um, so there's there's so many families that can benefit from the donations of the of the film and television community. I'm also just going to add. Um, I know we work in Los Angeles a lot. There are set recyclers that will come on and pick up your set pieces and reuse them to make new sets, um, which is you know a nice way to do that as well. I am moving on to our next question. Also uh, to our audience members, please feel free to type in a question. You can put it into the chat box or into the Q&A. Um, we have a couple more minutes here, but we have a question here that says, how has anyone been dealing with all of the disposable plastic products due to COVID? Well, I guess I can jump in here a bit. Uh, I know for us, uh, one of the waste haulers that we do use uh, is called Avis Waste Hauler and Earth Angel has done an astronomical amount of research with them to ensure that they can recycle items. Um, and so we, we're actually, they also are able to recycle things like soft plastics. So I guess it's really about trying to do research into what hauling systems are around you in your area. So even a practice that we used to encourage on, during, on our sets was telling people to always bring their plastic bags from home because residentially, unfortunately in New York, you cannot actually recycle those soft plastics, but we can do that on set. 
And we had a similar measure also with compostable items because before you could compost in the state of New York, but you really couldn't compost bones, which our waste hauler is able to do. But after COVID that did stop throughout the city. So we did always encourage people to always bring their compostable items on set because we could compost it for them. So I'd say definitely be great to reach out to organizations. I know also Earth Angel is operating in LA. So I'm sure they have a good roster of places that you can go to take like recyclable items so that you're not just throwing out your soft plastics and landfilling them to that extent. Depending on the size of the crew too, you can um, ask people to bring their actual utensils from home. You know, we've had a bit of success. I like to give the crew metal straws anyway, because I love them. <laughs> I think that it's like improved my quality of life to drink a cold drink with a metal straw. I never realized how cold a drink could be until I had one. Um, and they're better for the planet. But also I find that if it's a small team and the job, you know, television is much more difficult, but if it's not a job that's going to be months on end, then people are more willing to like bring their own stuff from home um, for a short amount of time and take it home and wash it and bring it back. Yeah, we're hoping as a wrap gift, the entire crew got their own uh, rewashable silverware, which actually the whole thing goes in the dishwasher if you want to do it that if you're really lazy. But um, yeah, we'll see how see who does it next year. It'll be interesting. So we've got one final question for us tonight. What's the best strategy for convincing someone who is who is set in their methods to convert to working paperlessly? There also is a little note there that says kudos to the entire bull production for going paperless on set. Just well, um, for us, I think it's um, sustainability is the key to be a successful worker at our company as well. So always communicating that um, in order to be successful, we have to think about sustainability in mind. And part of the Albert certification process is that we have to be a paperless um, production, and you can only have an opt-in policy. But as long as you're communicating from the get-go that this is just how things are gonna be, um, and you have to make sure that the leadership knows, and then that way it trickles down. But most of the time, we don't have much resistance and just making that process e as easy as possible. So if there is somebody having um, issues with the paperless, then just have a workshop for them to guide them through the paperless, um, whatever we do paperless payroll so we can guide our workers through paperless payroll processes just making that as easy as possible all right ladies and gentlemen i think that we've reached the end of our panel this evening thank you all of our panelists for joining us and sharing your stories and your approaches to greening your sets being sustainable and going green is a personal choice and a community effort. It involves communication, planning, leadership, financial, financial considerations, and problem solving. So basically it's producing. And I believe all of us are up for that challenge. PGA Green was established as part of the Guild's commitment to actively encourage and support sustainability in the entertainment industry. We hope that tonight's conversation has encouraged each of you to ignite, maintain, and grow your own sustainability practices and the approach to your productions. Please be sure to check out thegreenproductionguide.com to find more resources on how to green your sets. And for all of our PGA members joining us tonight, be sure to check out our new special discount for zero waste options for PPE from TerraCycle Regulated Waste, available on the PGA website and in the PGA newsletter. Thank you all again and good night.